Hello everybody, welcome or welcome back to Cloudy Cleric. I'm Oliver. Hi, hello. We're back in the studs. We're back in Utah. Boo. I don't like being back in Utah, but it's fine because I have my room. Today we're going to be talking about a subject that I'm very particularly passionate about. Okay, I didn't know I was super passionate about it until I saw this poll on Tumblr. I want to tell you I had opinions to share. Once I saw how long my reblog was, I was like, oh, I should probably make a video about this. I can't do it justice in this reblog. I'm a professional shit poster, even though I make no money off of YouTube. It's still my profession. So is this new style good? Is it working? Let me know. Am I goaded? Let me know. So I'm sure you've seen the title of this video, the title being why Mike Wheeler will be vecna in season five and why it matters. Um, I don't have any more anything else more to add to that, so we're just gonna get straight into it. Part one, what the fuck is being vecna Before I go over why Mike will be vecna I think it's important that I kind of review exactly what being vecna is and kind of refresh casual viewers who haven't seen the show in a hot second. Get posered vecna <laughs> I meant to say get vecna poser. Vecna refers to the character of Henry Creel slash one. The name was technically given to him as a placeholder, so Vecna did not choose the name Vecna whatsoever. The the Hawkins gang was just like, oh, we're gonna call him Vecna, and it just stuck, kind of like the Demogorgon. When they learned Vecna's true identity, they were like, are we calling him Vecna? Are we calling him Henry? Are we calling him one? Just know that they're all the same person. I'm gonna try to like solely use Vecna for this video so it doesn't get too confusing. If you hear me referring to Henry or one, that's Vecna. Okay, here is Vecna's origin story in a nutshell. Note before we get into this, I haven't seen the play The Last Shadow, which explains more of Henry's like background and childhood and growing up. This is solely stuff that is in the show. And I also had help from the fandom, Loki. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know we don't like fandom, but like, girl, there's no- I'm forced to. I'm forced to use fandom. The main cast of characters you need to know for this origin story is we have Henry, of course, our main character. Virginia is Henry's mom. Victor is Henry's dad. And Alice is Henry's sister. Let's start. Once upon a time, 60s. Well, actually, it was- it was 1959, but- Whatever. Henry Creel and his family move to Hawkins, Indiana. Henry realizes that he has telekinetic powers. He is also very angsty and he hates all happiness and joy. He tortures animals. He also realizes that he can like reach into the mind of other people. So he like, for shits and giggles, he does it to his family. The family notices the supernatural occurrences happening in the house and around town. The family believes that their house is being haunted by a demon or Satan or something like that. When Henry like reaches into the minds of the family to like give them visions and stuff, Victor describes them as like living waking nightmares and I'm sure this is starting to ring a bell for you if you've already seen the show this is where it gets good guys you need to listen up for this part Henry finally decides to kill his family in a very specific way as most children do listen up because this is important we have the Creel family sitting at the table munch 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 eating their dinner Henry starts to fuck with the radio and the dad gets up to look at the radio Victor the dad well, Victor's at the radio. Henry lifts his mom into the air and breaks all her bones with his powers and pops her eyes out. You know, just because a neck snap wasn't enough, apparently. His dad obviously doesn't know that it's Henry, so he takes Alice and Henry and he tries to run out of the house with both of them because he's like, we gotta go, guys. But Henry reaches into Victor's mind while he's trying to flee the house and makes him have a flashback to his trauma from serving in World War II. While he's giving Victor these visions, he decides to kill his sister in the same way. Then, in the vision, in Victor's vision, he starts hearing the music played from the radio and it's able to ground him back into reality. He kind of like is able to slip from Henry's grasp on his mind. Henry has been using his powers a lot. He kind of needs a recharge, but like he fucking used the shit out of them and he, and he falls into a coma just cause he ran out of energy to fuck with his dad and kill him. Be he was originally going to kill the dad, but the dad got away because Henry didn't know his own power. The dad gets blamed for the deaths. Henry's in the coma like we already discussed. He wakes up. He meets a Mr. Dr. Brenner. I'm sure we all know who this is. A side note, his dad was told that he died in the coma. So he never knew that these atrocious murders were committed by his son. 
<sighs> anyway, Brenner knows that Henry has powers, so he wants to test him like a little lab rat. He calls Henry one, he gets it tattooed on his wrist, which isn't familiar at all. Um, he performs a lot of tests on Henry, but I'm like 99% sure Henry stopped being complacent in these tests. Brenner had like a little chip installed in Henry's neck that limited his use of his powers. He still was in the like lab, the testing lab, but he just couldn't use his powers because of this chip in his mind. Exactly 20 years later in 1979, more spawns of children have happened and we're all the way up to number 11. Actually, I think we're- aren't we up to like number 13 by the time this happens? I don't know. But we have 11 and that's what matters. 11, she was kind of like the runt of the group. People were picking on her and I've already like discussed some like whether or not 11 was truly special or not, but anyway. Uh, seeing that 11 was kind of being like bullied and picked on, Henry's like, ooh, targeting you. I'm gonna manipulate you now. He tells her a bunch of shit. Like, he tells her that her fellow peers plan on killing her and Brenner's just gonna let them do it, which I don't- I don't think that's actually true, but, you know, whatever. The manipulation works. Henry's like, I'll let you escape. She goes to escape and then Henry's like, I can't go from here. And they- and she was like, why? Henry's like, I have this chip in my neck so they know where I am. And so Eleven was like, okay, I'll take it out. And he's like, what? crazy. Thank you. So 11 oh, takes it out. They're trying to escape. They get caught and Henry kills, kills the guards around them. And 11's like, what the fuck? How'd you do that? And then Henry's like, and he shows her his number and she's like, anywho, Henry's like, wait here. So then Henry goes and he uses his power to massacre the entire staff and test subjects at the lab. Even the kids. The kids didn't do shit, but like he killed them anyway. Using his fucking bone ripping method, popping their eyes out. Girl, literally what is that for? You were literally doing the most and for what? For what? I'm sorry. I, nobody asked you to do that. If a serial killer has a calling card, he's more likely to get caught. I'm just saying. Eleven gets impatient. She walks around the lab and she's like, what the fuck happened here? She sees the other kids that like, not were her friends, but like seeing any dead body for anybody can, can be traumatic. Especially like mutilated children bodies. She walks in to the rainbow room and she sees Henry killing the people. Henry kills two, aka the big bad bully. He looks at Eleven and he's like, will you take over the world with me? Will you help me destroy humanity? He like goes on this like big long monologue and then Eleven just goes, no. Join me. Literally, she is a boss. She, she ate him up. I'm not even gonna lie. Now they're fighting with their powers. Eventually, Eleven is able to overpower him. She's like, I'm gonna throw this twink to a different dimension. That's how much I fucking hate you. She like uses her powers and opens up the first rift we know to the upside down. She just throws him through, closes the fucking thing so he can't get back. Almost passes out, you know because she's overexerting herself. Plot twist, Brenner survived. Brenner opens the door and he's like, literally, what the fuck did you do? Because Henry isn't there. He's in the different dimension. When she throws Henry through the portal, he monsterfies. He gets fugly, I would say. Lightning strikes him and his flesh burns and it, and it looked like blisters all over him. It's freaky. When he's in this dimension, he sees this like big fucking cloud thing and he's like, wow, that looks like a spider. Let's be friends. And he tries to befriend the, the, the cloud. The cloud is the mind flare. He works on his powers in this dimension with the mind flare. I've heard that this dimension that Henry originally gets sent to is called Dimension X. I don't know if it's the same dimension as the Upside Down, like over time Dimension X just turned into the Upside Down, or if the Upside Down's like a parallel, like I don't know what the fuck's going on, but 
that doesn't matter. Back to Eleven. She suppresses her memories of the massacre. I wonder why. Brenner and Eleven, only survivors. Brenner gets more staff, obviously, because he's backed by the government. That's what they'll spend the taxpayer's money on. He continues to test Eleven because Brenner can't learn his fucking lesson. During one of these tests, Eleven accidentally opens a rift to the upside down. That's what causes Henry to get through to the real world. And if you're wondering, like, didn't she close the portal at the end of season one? Girl, h &L never learned their fucking lesson. They kept that bitch open. Okay, the end of Henry's story. Not the video. We're not even in the thick of it yet, guys. I'm pretty sure you've deducted, based on my story, what being vecna is. It's, it's basically just Henry's, like, fancy way of killing people. When he killed his family, it was kind of like the prototype. Also in Hawkins' lab, because he didn't have time to reach into their brains and give them fucking traumatic visions before he killed them. So now in the present, in 1986, Vecna usually chooses his victims, just kind of reaches into the mind of somebody, and then kills them. He was able to get into his dad's mind super easy, just because, like, like, he's been around them. And then obviously the Hawkins lab ma massacre, he was just kind of like kill and go, kill and go. But in order to kill victims remotely, which is what he does now in the series, my theory is he invades their mind, but it takes him like 24 hours to completely invade their mind. It's kind of like he plants a virus in their brain. And once that's happened, he has like enough of a connection with them to like kill them remotely. For 24 hours, he gives his victims terrible visions and then he kills them. You know, and that's why it's Vecna and not Henried, because Vecna just sounds cooler. Like, you just got Henried. Plus, the signature Vecna method that we know it happened after his, like, burnt toastification. In my mind, Henry is the child that we see in the flashbacks. One is Jamie Campbell Bauer that we see in the, like, Hawkins Lab flashbacks, and Vecna is 1986. You know? Okay. It makes sense to me. That's all it is. Yeah, that's normal. Okay. So where does Michael Wheeler come into all of this, I hear you saying? Well, I'll tell you right now. Part two, but why Michael? What outfit change? It's definitely not the next day. Don't worry about it. So I'm sure you can see how Mike is a candidate to be a, a victim of Vecna's just because he's an angsty teen that lives in Hawkins. So like basically two basic criteria to being Vecna. However, during season four, Mike takes a trip to the fictional city of Lenora Hills in SoCal, or at least I think it's in SoCal. Maybe I'm projecting. I don't know. So he unintentionally slips from Vecna's grasp for now. So why does it matter that Mike is Vecna, especially when he wasn't even there for the first round? I'm gonna separate my take on this question into three different parts. I have, I, I have so many pieces of evidence and points to bring up to prove myself here. So please get comfy because I don't know how long this section will be. If you thought the last section was dragging on a little bit long just to get ready for this one, I'm gonna get comfy. Yeah, we're getting comfy. The first section of this video is going to talk about why Mike is the candidate for Vecna. The second is going to talk about how Mike getting Vecna could possibly affect the show and the characters and why it makes sense narratively. The third section is entirely dedicated to why Will is not going to be Vecna or at least Vecna in the same way that Mike is. So why Mike will be truly by definition Vecna, but Will won't. Section one, Mike Wheeler is the target victim for Vecna. So Vecna's it girl. A common trait among Vecna's victims is repressed trauma. For Max, it was her feelings about Billy and his death. For Chrissy, it was her eating disorder. For Fred, it was survivor's guilt. And for Patrick, it was an abusive home life. For Nancy, who like kinda got Vecna, it was her PTSD and guilt surrounding Barb. However, like Nancy wasn't really a first choice. So what makes Mike's trauma any worse than the other characters? Or what makes it more appealing to Vecna? Most of the other characters are either more traumatized than Mike is, or more personally connected with Vecna. You are wrong! Mike is still a traumatized little whore, okay? So let's elaborate on that, why don't we? Mike's main trauma, as discussed in the show, is bullying. The show even makes it a point to bring it up again in season four during the from Mike, from Mike, from Mike fight. Why didn't you tell me what's going on here? I mean, you know, I'm not exactly Mr. Popularity back at home. I mean, you've seen it. I've been bullied my entire life. I mean, I, I know what it's like. 
So the most extreme example of him being bullied happens way, way, way back in the first season. I feel like the implications of this scene, we don't talk about it enough, or at least the general fandom doesn't. That's right, I'm talking about the infamous cliff scene from season one, episode six, The Monster. For those of you guys who need to be caught up really quick, I'm just gonna give like a little summary of the scene. It's not gonna be as long as my Vecna backstory part, okay? So don't worry. Troy and James, the big bads of Hawkins middle find Mike and Dustin searching for L. They're like, ah shit, we should run from them because there are bullies. They run all the way to the quarry and Troy and James corner them. Troy pulls a knife, a switchblade, and since they're total fucking wimps, they can't defend themselves and they also can't throw rocks apparently. <laughs> I throw numb nuts. Anywho, Troy ends up getting Dustin in a little headlock, and first he tells Mike to pee himself. <laughs> He's like, do it! Pee yourself. Mike's like, no. He's like, okay, guess I have to resort to plan B. Okay, go and fucking jump off a cliff then. Okay, okay. Otherwise, he's going to cut out Dustin's teeth. And Dustin's like, don't do it, I can survive this. And Mike's like, really considering this deal. Troy starts counting down, and this is only a couple seconds afterwards, so like he just had this proposition for him like maybe a minute ago, or even less. When he's counting down, when he gets to one, Mike fucking steps off the cliff. I'm not even joking, he steps off the cliff. But luckily, Elle is there to save the day. She uses her powers to Mike back to land. She breaks Troy's arm, and she's like, go! My arm! My arm! Go. The boys run off, and then Dustin and Mike and Elle hug, and it's like, friendship Aww. forever. Most viewers, for like some really odd reason, just decided to like brush off that scene, and they're just like, oh, it's such a cute loyalty and friendship moment. I want to give a gentle reminder that Mike did not know that L was there. Did not know that L was going to save him. Mike Wheeler, at 12 years old, decided to willingly jump off a cliff. He barely hesitated. What if Eleven wasn't there to save him? He would have died! And I'm not trying to say that the sole purpose of that action was for Mike to kill himself. I just think it's more of a sign and like a pretty clear indicator that Mike has suicidal tendencies. After all, like, he's the only person we've seen in the entire show actively try to attempt. Circling back to our repressed trauma point, if my analysis of the cliff scene was something new to you, or like, it opened your eyes or gave you some, like, realization that you haven't had about the show yet, I think that just goes to show and prove how repressed that trauma is, especially from for Mike. Mike doesn't talk about it, repressed trauma, super bottled up. Also, why do you think he's been such an asshole lately? And like, I'm all here for the Mike Wheeler asshole agenda. I don't get why people are hating on my boy, except for when he's rude to Hopper, fuck that. But when he's, an, when he's just a general asshole, I'm like, go King, do it, but not to Hopper. Sometimes you gotta like take a step back and just wonder, why? Why is he the way that he is? Mike has very little experience with Vecna. He wasn't in Hawkins for the first attacks, and he doesn't have first-hand experience with Vecna's method, you could say. Sure, he has, like, second-hand accounts, but, like, he wasn't there for the initial shit show. I think this is a very, very good reason for Vecna to target Mike. After all, he's already captured Will, literally caused him to get possessed. I'll touch more on those later. And all the others were either there in Hawkins or they got vecna themselves, except for Jonathan. When I tell you my reasons for why Mike is most likely gonna get vecna you'll probably see why I can make a stronger case for Mike. But that's not to say that both of them can't be vecna That would be just absolutely terrible for Will. But why not play with a new human, a new challenger? Oh my god. God. I feel like that one video of Dream. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I don't think that Mike can even really conceptualize the extent of Vecna's powers and what he does to a victim. So more fun for Vecna, I guess. And then finally, through Mike's general behavior changes throughout the series, we can tell that Mike is like almost at a breaking point. He went from being a sweet, like loving, loyal friend in season one and two to being like a complete bitch ass, snarky teen in seasons three and four. Behavior changes like that are, are very indicative of a breaking point. And Vecna loves it when his victims are at a breaking point. Get it? 
It's a bone-breaking pun. I'm sorry. Okay, next, it adds spice. Being Vecna gives a voice to a character's darkest fears and secrets. It quite literally is able to visually manifest itself in a very convincing and horrifying way. This means that it can be a great turning point for a character depending on what vision Vecna wants to give them. Narratively, this invented plot device can help speed up character development. A great example of this is Max Letters. Her vision and realization of death causes her to finally write down her feelings and say everything she's wanted to say to the people in her life, developing both her character and her friends around her. Vecna has also taken people to show them things from his past as well, or reveal his plans, like he did with Nancy, moving the plot forward by revealing new information. So it can be a turning point for a character and also reveal new information. But what about both at the same time? <laughs> Mike, even as described in the show, is in a word oblivious to pretty much everything around him, including his own feelings. Dustin is the first person to point this out in the show, like literally telling him, you are so oblivious. Sometimes your total obliviousness just blows my mind. Finn Wolfhard, who is Mike's actor for those who are uneducated, has also admitted that Mike is just like, dumb, dumb, stupid. <laughs> I wonder if Finn Wolfhard hates Mike Wheeler as much as the rest of us for hurting Will. He's just such an idiot. I don't understand. He's very, very, very clueless. Yeah, it was pretty heartbreaking actually to do that, to do that scene of just like, how do you not understand that your friend is struggling through something? Oblivious characters, it logically makes sense for their arc to be realizing what they're oblivious to. And what more perfect of a way to make Mike confront these realizations than him being vecna -ed. The answer is no. There is no better way. That way is perfect. Mike is very obviously a queer-coded character. Like, I don't think anybody can really deny that at this point. Something about that man is not straight. What if he came to this realization about himself being queer through being vecna -ed? What if it started a war within himself due to some sort of internalized homophobia? It's not my fault you don't like girls. Yes, Michael, it is your fault that Will doesn't like girls. From Vecna's perspective, it's like a double whammy. First, he's Vecna, and he, and, he fucks, and he fucks with him, and he tortures him. And then, boom! He's fighting even more with himself, like, internally. Like, it's like a domino effect. He's fighting more than, than Vecna. He's fighting the gay demons. I'm a firm believer in Byler, in case you have never watched any other of my videos on this channel, or you can't tell by my personality. They are my two little special guys, and I want to hold them in my hand and I want to play with them like slime. Sorry, that's unrelated. Um, anywho, my next point is, even if you don't think that Mike is queer, even though he's like pretty gay, Mike could still come to a realization through being vecna -ed. Gayness isn't the only option, even though it's a good option. It's one of the best, I think. Here are some other things that Mike could come to terms with rather than being gay through being vecna -ed. Number one, Will has a crush on him even if he doesn't reciprocate. There's no way that Mike isn't going to find out. You know, there's no way they're just gonna like sweep that under the rug. Number two, a fear of losing Will. And I'm gonna say Will because David Harbour said that the main characters this season would be Mike, Will, Eleven, Joyce, and Hopper. He already knows about his fear of losing Eleven. He's already very aware of that. Along with Will taking center stage, I'm just gonna say Will, you know, you know. Number three, he could have revelations about his relationship with Elle, whether you believe that these revelations will be positive or not. Number four, internalized fears of turning into his father. I can't find anything super canon that confirms this. I just have a feeling that Mike fears this, okay? Nancy has also been shown to, like, fear growing up to be her mother, so I don't think it's that big of a jump to be like, Mike doesn't want to end up like his father, plus his father's like kind of an asshole. Number five, his mental illness. His mental illness. His mental illness. I hope you're chanting at home or wherever you're watching this. I don't know. On that note, like kind of related, but a lot of people think that like Mike has borderline personality disorder or autism or both, but that's like an entirely separate video that I plan to make sometime in the future, but I just don't know when I'll get around to it. I'm just trying to point out that he has symptoms of being like diagnosably mentally ill. In secondary canon, aka canon that is secondary, wow. 
That's what I wrote. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna explain what I'm about to talk about, and then you'll realize what secondary canon is if you don't know. In the spin-off novel Lucas on the Line, it's implied that after Will leaves, and because Will leaves, Mike decides to spend all day in his basement in the dark playing his Nintendo when he, like, barely talks to anybody. Does that sound like anything to you guys? Because to me, it sounds like depression. DEPRESSION! The reason why I call it secondary canon is because, yes, it is from an official spin-off, but the novel also, like, kind of conflicts a little bit with the timeline. Nonetheless, it still is a published work that is meant to reflect Mike's character, so take that as you will. This is to say, that Mike being Vecna would, like, be the ultimate wake-up call for him, from a Byler standpoint or otherwise. Also, almost every character has an emotional investment in Mike. The entire party, obviously, because he's the de facto leader or whatever. Nancy, also obviously, because she's his sister. Jonathan and Joyce, by extension through Will. Elle, because we all know besties. Hopper through L. Steve, because he's been through shit with them. Robin, by extension of Steve. Murray, through extension of Joyce. And Erica, because she's literally fought with Mike. d and I just want to illustrate how Mike being vecna would affect everyone in some sort of negative way. Adding on to the, like, Mike is the de facto leader of the party, Vecna killing Mike just kind of show how, how how much- how business Vecna is. Like, he means business. That's what I'm trying to say. He already took Max. I mean, she's alive, but he already took Max. Like, insult to injury, you know? So make it make sense, okay? Mike is not safe. We're in the last section. Holy shit. But obviously it's gonna be Will. No! It will not be Will. I actually need to go pee. I'm gonna go pee real quick. I can only hold in so many Diet Dr. Peppers, guys. And ch iced chais. Two signature Oliver drinks. <sighs> getting comfy again. So technically speaking, Will has already been vecna -ed. I don't know why I only did it with one hand. He's already been vecna -ed. In the show, we are shown many, many times how Will has a special connection with the Upside Down. Even in season four, Will doesn't only connect himself to the Upside Down, he expresses that he's connected himself to Vecna, specifically. I can feel him. It's strange knowing now who it was this whole time. I can still remember what he thinks and how he thinks. I definitely feel like Will is going to have some sort of interaction with Vecna because it would be dumb to like not think that, but Will is like almost too personal of a case to be vecna -ed. Let me explain. I've already illustrated how totally evil and psychotic Vecna can be, and I think it definitely fits within his character to want to kill Will, the one that got away, through a particularly special and cruel method. He doesn't get to serve another regular method, no no no, he gets a special Willified version. Just like how he wants to kill L. He doesn't just want to vecna L. he wants to do so much more than that. It it just isn't in Vecna's dramatic ass nature to just want to kill somebody that personal to him just like that. I definitely feel like Vecna would have bigger plans as to how to kill Will. You could make this exact case about Max. Max was just some random teen to Vecna at the beginning of the series. Not a personal case for Vecna whatsoever. But Max was able to fight back and learn more about Vecna. She recognized his weak points, giving vital information to the Hawkins group. Plus she has a connection with Eleven. Because of this, Vecna targeting Max became more and more personal. Vecna makes sure to kill Max in a particularly slow and excruciating way compared to how he kills Fred or Chrissy or... <laughs> he fell asleep, guys. Patrick, that's his name. You could say that the Spice was killing Max in front of L. Mike Wheeler isn't just another Chrissy or Fred or Patrick. He is, as we've discussed, he's fresh meat for Vecna, very, very personally connected with Vecna's greatest threats, Will and Eleven, but not to Vecna himself. It matters that he dies, but he doesn't have that much stake in Mike. Targeting Mike is basically like killing three birds with one stone. It would be devastating for Mike to be vecna for both L and Will, whether it works or it doesn't work. It could also act as a symbol for, like, 
like trying to kill or killing the group's heart. Since Will takes center stage in season five, I want to look more into how Mike being vecna would hurt Will more than the vice versa. For Will, it's extremely personal in a way that Mike can't really understand. Vecna has been shown to parallel Will in his childhood, such as their drawings. They were both described as like being sort of sensitive kids. I, I feel like the writers want the audience to make this connection so that we can see that Will is a foil for Vecna. It is very, very possible that Vecna knows about Will's gayness and his crush on Mike, so it would be even more cruel to target Mike in front of Will. Vecna is one of the only people that know that Will is gay and likes Mike, and he's just like, fuck that, I'm gonna I'm gonna target him. Jesus, that's so angsty. Will is also a very selfless person, so I wouldn't be surprised if he would sacrifice himself to save Mike, that kind of thing. But in reality, Will would have to stand idly by watching the person, Vecna, that took away his happy childhood by kidnapping him in 1983, torture his best friend and crush Mike Wheeler, the person that he's loved, and one of the only characters that has been shown to truly understand Will. You know on a, a Viewmaster when it gets like, Cop between two slides? Yeah, yeah, like that. He would have to watch as Vecna gave Mike these terrible visions and nightmares, tormenting him and tearing him down, everything that Mike knows and loves, and Will wouldn't be able to do anything. Vecna knows that after Mike is dead, Will probably won't be able to function anymore. He probably suspects that Will might just give up right then and there, and Vecna didn't even have to lift a finger for that to happen. I mean, he had to... He had to do his stuff to Mike, but he didn't have to do anything to make Will just give up like that. It was just, again, like dominoes falling. It would affect Elle in the same way. She's already basically lost Max, and now she's lost Mike, her closest friend. Mike was the first person to ever show true compassion for Elle. He offered her a place to stay, he gave her food after she escaped the lab, he trusted her, he showed concern for her. He was truly Elle's first friend. I don't think Elle would voluntarily give up after seeing Mike die, but I definitely definitely think that it would be a distraction to say the least for her. It would definitely throw her for a loop and it would be something that would be very hard for her to cope with. With Elle and the help of the rest of the cast, it is it is very likely that they'll be able to take down Vecna in season 5. But Elle basically carries everyone along the way. So without Elle, they can't do it. Elle and Vecna are pretty similarly matched by this. So even if it's just one tiny distraction, such as vecna Mike, can give Vecna the upper hand for him to win this battle. And if you're thinking, Will being vecna would also massively affect Elle, their siblings refer back to the previous sections where I go over why Vecna wouldn't particularly want to target Will. So that brings us to our conclusion. Mike Wheeler, despite being labeled as the oblivious stubborn leader of the group, is one of the many complex characters in the series. However, his character hasn't really been explored that much yet. Like I said earlier, what better way to explore this rather than him getting vecna Or What better way to explore that than having him being targeted by the person that has been tormenting his two best friends for years? Mike being vecna would make Mike finally understand what's going on and coming to terms with his trauma. It would effectively take out two of his biggest threats by extension. It would call back to how important and crucial he was at the beginning of the series. I'm not saying I want Mike to die, and I'm not saying that Mike is going to die. I am just saying that I 1000% believe that Vecna will set his sights on Mike in season five without a shadow of a doubt. So that's all I have written down. This video kind of took a little bit to make. I'm sure you can tell the script was long and that kind of stuff. If you're watching this, I finished it. If you liked this video, please make sure to like and subscribe. I do a lot of Byler related videos and I want to do um, a more like cinematography deep dive for Byler stuff. So if that's something that interests you, please make sure to subscribe. I didn't film a video during Hanukkah, so I couldn't tell you guys happy Hanukkah but happy late Hanukkah guys. I think I'm gonna be opening up a discord server for people to talk on but I don't know if I'm gonna do that yet. I think that's all I have for you guys today. I will see you guys next time. Bye!